Welcome to the beginner tutorial for Unity. So this series is for the Robbinsville High School Game Development Club. But anyone's welcome to watch. If you're not part of this club and you just come across this on YouTube, feel free to watch. But for the members of the Robbinsville Game Development Club, this is a great tutorial for starting off if you're not sure what to do with Unity or what to make with Unity. So this is a project I was working on a couple of hours before this. And I'm going to show you, like, once you open up Unity, what to do to make a new project. So when you open it up, you're going to see something along these lines, where you have a dialog box with an option for your project name and where you want the location to be. So you're going to want to make a folder for your Unity projects. Mine's called Unity Projects in my documents. You can put yours wherever you want, on your desktop, in your public documents like mine, or in your regular documents. It's really up to you and you're, you're going to want to make a project name. So I guess I'll call this um, uh, Tutorial Game. So for our club at this moment, we're only going to be working with 2D games because it's easy to teach. But for anyone looking for 3D games, there may be tutorials in the future. But for now, you can choose whether or not you want a 3D game or a 2D game. So choose 2D, and once you click on it, it will be red. And you can choose to create a new project now. Okay, so now we're in our new project, and I guess I'll go over what each window means. So this right here is the scene view, and yours might not look like this, but there are ways to set it up however you want it. I think your hierarchy might defaultly be on the left side like this. Um, I recommend you take it and you push it over to this side. It's a lot easier to manage because when you click on an object in the hierarchy, it gives you the details, and all your details will just be to the right of it. It's a lot easier to look at, in my opinion. So to start off with, we have our scene view. And in our scene view, we can edit whatever happens in our level of the game or whatever um, camera properties we have, so on and so forth. This is basically a graphical output for what we're going to see when we actually play the game. Well, actually, it's a graphical um, display of editing the game. The graphical output for what we see when we play the game is the game screen. So that should be one tab over to the right. I'm not sure what the default layout for Unity looks like, but I'm pretty sure a few of the things I have open aren't on there. So I'll show you how to make sure that all these things are open. So the game view is exactly what you're going to see when you play the game. It's a full rendering of what it's going to look like. And if you want to, for example, change the background color of this camera, right? we can go to the main camera and then we can edit those properties. So let's say we make the background color red. Now when we go to our game view, it's a red background. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. To start off and keep things simple, let's just talk about the rest of the windows. So this is your assets window. And down here is all the objects that you're using within your game. So any textures you make, any music you have and you want to add in, any code you have for each different class, that all goes down in your assets here. The hierarchy are the objects in the scene that can be moved around. So for example, our main camera, right? That's an object that we can move around, so that's in our hierarchy. If anything exists in this scene, it will be in your hierarchy. And the inspector inspects things that you click on within your hierarchy. If you select multiple things and they have stuff in common, then the inspector will allow you to edit anything in common or make something in common. But I'll get to that later. To start off, you always have a camera. And it's necessary. It's your main camera. This is what is being rendered in your game view. Anything you put in will be rendered by your main camera. If you want them to get a little bit more organized and you like having your game screen maximized when you test it, you can choose all these options up here, such as maximize on play. Now when we play, it will actually make it larger. You can mute the audio of the game if you're doing something else. You don't want to listen to your game audio. You can see the stats of the game, which displays um, your frame rate. Obviously, this game doesn't have anything in it, so it's going to have a frame rate of 2,000 frames per second and gizmos are more for um, a debugging type approach to looking at your game. So if you want to make it even more maximized, say you have a second monitor, you can drag out the window here and actually adjust this as a separate window. You can drag it onto your second monitor. You guys can't see mine. But you can drag it on there and full screen it. I'll full screen it here just so you can see. You just press the little full screen button. 
and now you have a full screen version of it. So you can adjust the editor to however you want. You can make it take up your entire monitor display if you want. It's really up to you, and it's up to your preferences. You'll kind of develop habits over the time, so don't worry too much about that right now. And also, I guess the last thing to cover that's important would be the console, which is located down here. And all of your errors, messages, warnings will show up in this console. The idea of making a game is that you won't have any errors or messages in the console when you publish it. You want to try and get all that out. Sometimes if you're working with iPhone games, there might be an error on Google's side for their API, for example, and there's nothing you could do about that. Maybe you could look into it and try and fix it, but the idea is to have as little errors as possible. So let's start off with putting something into our scene. So we don't have anything at all. We can drag in pictures or images if we want to, but if you're just starting off now and you want to play around a bit, you can right click on your assets um, window, go to create, choose sprites, and from here you can create any geometrical shape you want. So there's squares, triangles, diamonds, hexagons, circles, and then polygon. You can basically edit it to make it whatever you want. We're going to put in a square. We're going to call it square. Let's press enter. Now you have a square. Nice job. We can also make other shapes too. So let's create a triangle. There we go. We have a triangle. Now a huge question a lot of people have is how do you edit the import settings of an object? To edit import settings, you just simply click on it in the assets view. A lot of confusion comes up because there's different instances of sprites within the scene and sprites within the assets. Sprites within the asset are standard across the entire project. If you want to edit import settings, you edit it in the assets folder, because this is almost the gateway to our game. Our game takes properties from the assets folder and uses them to make the game. If you want to edit the import settings, you do it from here. And in later tutorials, I'll probably go over this. This is a more basic tutorial, just as you know what things are, what they do, where they are, how to find them, just frequently asked questions. So to add this square to our scene, we just simply click on it and drag it and drop it. And now we have a square in our scene. So the default 2D settings should have it set up in a mode where, um, sec. Okay. The default 2D settings should have it in a mode where you have these blue anchors on the edge of everything. And by dragging these around, you can adjust the size and the orientation of a sprite really easily. But for the sake of this tutorial, I'll go over what the other anchors do. They're not as useful for 2D coding as they are for 3D coding, but they do have some good use and they're good to know. A good fundamental thing to know. So these are your different types of tools you can use. This is the pan. So to pan, you simply click on this and then move around and it kind of drags you around the screen however you desire. You can also use this tool, which drags stuff around along the X, Y, and Z axis. However, we can't drag it on the Z axis because we're in two-dimensional space. So pan, and then drag. Now, if you want to use shortcuts for these, um, I believe it's Q for pan, W for the drag tool, and the rest are so on and so forth. So you go across QWERTY to use all these tools. But a simple way to pan is just to push down your mouse wheel. So don't scroll up, don't scroll down, just push it down and that will pan for you. Now rotation. Um, rotation is good. This outer axis is based on the one that you're facing, so this will be the Z axis, which is the one we want. But the other axes are used for orientations that won't be useful in 3D, 2D space, because 2D space um, only can see one type of rotation. This is the scaling tool. And by dragging these little anchors here, we could scale the X and the Y. And if we scale the middle, it will keep it to proportion and also scale the, um, the Z, which we can't really see. So, I mean, it's, it's scaling it, but it won't make a difference because 2D objects are have a zero um, Z dimension. So scaling zero by a factor of a million is still zero, it doesn't matter. But if you want to keep things to proportion and scale them up, you can use this. Now this is the first tool we were on, the one that worked really well with the blue anchors. And the reason why you're going to want to use this with 2D space is because when you adjust it, it doesn't actually move the Z around, which is nice and organized. 
And also there are shortcuts you can use with it, such as holding shift will keep it in proportion and only moves it about one side. So to adjust the positioning and the scale to make sure that um, this anchors properly. So you can use shift to move it about one side. You can use shift to scale it about one face or one um, edge. And you can just scale it however you want and move it around however you want. It's really easy. You just click on it and move it around. It's a lot easier than having to do this. Although this is still pretty good if you want to be precise and move things in a straight line. So those are the main tools you'll use. Um, for zooming in, just scroll forward. Zooming out, scroll backwards. For panning, push down the mouse wheel. That's the easiest way. It's pretty complicated if you keep switching between the pan tool and your other tools. Okay, so that's how you move stuff around in the editor. So we're going to put in this square, triangle, and now another square. And we're going to play around with some settings. So if we go to our square, right off the bat, we have two basic settings that come with it. And that's a transform and a sprite render. So this is actually pretty important to understand before you actually get into any sort of game making or programming. Everything in the hierarchy, every single one of these, is a game object. Game objects contain classes called components. These components adjust the settings of the game object and give them properties. These components can be unique across other components and other game objects. So for example, this sprite renderer, I can change the color of it, but it's not going to change the color of every square. These two sprite renderers are different. These two squares are different. The only thing they have in common is that they have the sprite render using the sprite square. You have to think of them as different objects. That's very important. Although they look the same and I drag them from the same texture, all they have in common is their sprite render component with the square sprite on it. And I could just change that to a triangle if I want to. So keep that in mind that textures aren't objects. These are just textures. They're sprites and that each game object is separate unless they're the same prefab, which we will get into. So I'll make this square red. I'll make this triangle um, blue with a slight alpha to it. So like by lowering the alpha, it becomes less opaque or more translucent. And I'll make this um, square black. I'll make it more of a thin rectangle. Actually, I'll rotate it by putting my mouse in this little region over here and make it do a diamond. Okay. So now if we look at our game view, this is a rendering of all of our different objects. So that if we played the game right now, this is what it would look like. There's no real movement, they're just objects that exist. Pretty boring game. So we can actually experiment around with some of these properties though. So first off, looking at sprite renderers, there are sorting layers. So sorting layers allow you to organize your shapes and what comes in front and what comes in the back because 2D objects um, line up differently than a 3D object. If you're looking at it in the orthographic perspective, if something's behind something, there's no chance of you seeing it. You can't just like walk around and see it. So sorting layers actually matter. Sorting layers really define your Z, if you think about it. You're choosing where their Z is, how far forward they are, how far backwards they are, even though they're actually on the same plane. So we can adjust it by, say, going over to our sorting layers and adding a new layer, which we already just added in. I'm going to name it, though. So you press, um, do that a little bit slower. You can press sorting layer and then add sorting layer. And now you're at a list of sorting layers. Um, you can delete a sorting layer by clicking on it and pressing minus. You can add one by pressing plus. We're going to name the layer square and triangles. So the layers work so that way whatever is on the bottom shows up first. So default would be on the lowest. Anything in the default layer is behind everything else. Everything on the square layer is in front of default and behind triangles, and triangles is in front of everything. If you want to adjust these layers, you can just drag these around if you change your mind throughout your game development. So we're going to put triangles on the triangle layer, and we're going to put squares on the square layer. Okay. So now that squares are on the square layer, the squares are on the same layer, and this triangle is above it now. So this triangle, this translucent triangle, will always be above these squares, no matter 
how the game chooses to render them in or whatever order they're rendered in. As for the squares, it's actually going to be a little bit random because they're on the same layer in the same sublayer. Now the sublayer is the order in layer. If I want to adjust this to make this as predictable as possible, I could say red squares come in front of black squares and I could set that to 1. And now, since our black square is on the squares layer, which means it comes behind triangles, and on the zero sublayer or order and layer, our red square is on one, that means that the red square will come in front because it has a higher value. This could be any value you want, it just takes a comparison. So they're still in front of each other. But if I made this one 9999, now it's in front. That's how it works. It's important to keep that in mind when you're working with sprites that you want to keep everything organized on layers. The key to having a good game is organization. So I guess I'll get into some other stuff now. If you take a square or any game object and you drag it into another one, so we're going to drag it into this square, it now becomes a child of that object. So now when I move this object around, everything below it is moved with it. And this can be used for a number of things. And there's so many different things that um, can be used to make new properties and all sorts of um, game experiences using parenting and childing, but I'll get into that in a more advanced tutorial. All you need to know is that you can do this and that once you do it, when this one moves, this one also moves. However, if you move this one, that doesn't move with it. Parents affect childs, but childs don't affect parents. That's important. Um, it looks like I accidentally adjusted something I didn't mean to adjust. Some weird, like, what weird's going on there? Oh, okay, I see what I did. So that's how that's how um, childing and parenting works. Um, so I guess I'll get into components a little bit more now. So if we go to an object, for example, um, we're going to unparent these now. To do that, you just drag it off into anywhere, and it will unparent it. Um, we're going to take this red square, and we're going to give it some physical properties. So we're going to do add component, and now we have a list of all sorts of things we can add to it. And each component gives it a new property. So we're going to add the physics 2D box collider component. And now we have a green box collider. For people who don't really aren't really experienced with games or game technology, I mean game terms, a box collider or a collider just text it, detects to see if another collider is touching it. It's as simple as that. The difference between a trigger and a collider is that triggers detect to see if something are inside of it, and they allow things to pass through it, whereas colliders prevent um, any sort of passing through of the object. So this is a collider, meaning that anything that's also a collider that touches it won't be able to pass through it. We're now going to make this box here a collider as well. So we're going to go to Add Component, Physics 2D, Box Collider. And now we have that green um, layer around it. So from here, we can actually add physics to this object. So we're going to do add component, physics 2D, rigid body 2D. When we click on this, if we press play now, our object is actually going to be affected by gravity, as you can see. If I put it like this, it will fall on its side, balance over, and then fall. Cool. Within each component that you add onto an object, you can adjust, or micro adjust, I should say, any sort of setting you want. So you can do that by clicking with this on any sort of um, any sort of name. You'll get this little arrow, and you can drag it up and down, and you'll get very small adjustment changes. This is really useful, especially if you're adjusting the position of an object, because it works with this too. You can click on the X here and drag this left and right rotation. You can drag left and right just by clicking on it, and you get very fine adjustments. Um, if you want to make big adjustments, you can just type into the box. So making the mass bigger isn't really going to do anything because mass doesn't affect gravity. But if another object was um, a rigid body in this scene had a less mass, it wouldn't be um, able to push this object nearly as well. So that's the gist of that. Um, so I guess this will be it for this tutorial, and I'll do a second part just to split up the videos, and we'll work more on um, physics and adding components to objects. So thanks for watching, and check out the next tutorial.